Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Melvin, good to see you. We've been praying for you. These are hard days and praying for you. And, and um, this may be a little personal for you today because it was um, in preparing for your wife's funeral that God began to speak to me on this. I was already dealing with this scripture and, and I even hinted some of this at the funeral. And so you need to know that you love Melvin very much and so was Nancy. You've been given a rope, a little piece of rope. And I hope you don't throw it away quickly. It took me two days to do these, and that's no lie. There's 250 of these somewhere, and I made sure the nursery, I almost had the kids' connection stay up here today. In fact, I really struggled because I don't know what the Lord's going to do with this, but when I was preparing it, I was preparing it, and I felt the same way as I did when I was working on Carry the Water. And so if I had a choice, knowing there's so many people that are sick, I preach it again next Sunday. So hold on to this. I'm going to challenge you. Now I thought, all right, how long? Well, everybody know when tax day is? April 15th, isn't it? April 27th, for some of us. Actually, my, I do my taxes on the 27th. But April the 15th is the deadline. I don't care. I would like for you to hold on to it longer. You'll find out why I want you to hold on to it at least until April 15th. How many of you got someone right now that is hurting? That is struggling? Someone where it looks like maybe the enemy is having more victories than, than God? Someone who needs a friend? Someone really needs another Christian to be a true brother or a sister in Christ? Someone that will hold on when they don't want to hold on? towards the end of the message or maybe even sooner I'm going to ask you to commit yourself to come to the altar lay that on the altar wherever and for you to pray for that one I want you to take the rope with you put it wherever it is that you can remember it you may find yourself in the place where you really need someone to hold the rope and so it's not so much coming about having to pray for someone you may find yourself today where you need to go to someone and say, I need you to hold the rope. I need you to hold on for me. There are at least three stories that I have found in Scripture where holding the rope seems to be the thing. The one in Joshua. And of course, we've been going through the Old Testament and making this application to the New Testament, how it applies. So I've picked Joshua chapter 2. But there's two in the New Testament. There's Mark chapter 2. Four men have a friend, a friend who can't get to Jesus. These four men have tons of hope and faith, and they really believe in what Jesus can do. So these four men bring their friend to Jesus. They try the door, they try the windows, they try every way to bring them in and just say, here, I want to give you my friend. Jesus, do your thing, Jesus, in his life. We believe you can do your thing in his life. But if you remember the story, the room was so full, there was no room at the door, at the window, there was nowhere. So they go up on top of the roof, they make a hole, and they lower him down. The four men are leaning over, holding on to their friend and lowering him down until they lay him nice and tenderly at the feet of Jesus. And, and you know what Jesus does in Mark chapter 2? He looks up and he looks down and he says, and he saw their faith. He saw their faith. The faith of the ones holding the rope and the one that was on the end of the rope. And God moved and, and responded to that man. The other one is in Acts chapter 9. 
and the bravery and the sacrifice of those men in Acts chapter 9 amazes me. Paul is on his way to persecute Christians down the Damascus Road. He has an encounter with Jesus. He's struck blind, and he's left three days sitting off to the side, not eating, not drinking, not sleeping. God calls a man who is one of the leaders in, in, that, in Damascus who doesn't want to go. He doesn't want to go. He's afraid of this man named Saul of Tarsus. But God convinced him to go. He goes, he comes to him, he finds him. And you know the story. Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul. And he really is changed. He's changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the presence of Jesus Christ. And he and says, and immediately he goes out into the synagogue and he begins to preach about Jesus, how Jesus is the Christ. And he does so in such a way that everybody's sitting around saying, isn't this the one who's supposed to be persecuting Christians? But now he's in front of us preaching Christ. And there was such a stir in the city that the Jews, got, I mean, think about it. He came into their place of worship. He took over their place of worship and he preached the one that they said was, was more like the Antichrist, but who was really the Christ and he takes over the worship and people are coming to faith and they said, that's it. And they say, we will not rest until he is killed. They want to do to him what he did to them or was supposed to be doing to others. And then the Bible says that they were watching the gates. These who wanted to kill Paul were watching the gates. In other words, Paul is stuck in the city. And then it says some disciples not friends <laughs> they're not friends they don't know him yet they're not even sure they can trust him yet they're just believers they're disciples and they risk their life they risk their life they put him in a basket and lower him down the wall out a window slowly lowering him down until he gets to safety they risk their own life for a brand new believer that they don't even know whether they can trust yet. They held the rope. Then we come to Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 and following. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from, Achaia, uh, from the Achaia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho, so they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab. That's important. You might want to bring up that one slide where it's just the, where it says Rahab. Rahab is introduced in Scripture. All but one time she's introduced as the harlot or the, ra or the prostitute. Every time but once. One time, only one time in Scripture where she is not called the prostitute. But all the other times, she's the prostitute. In fact, it usually starts by calling her the prostitute before it gives her name. So they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. They stayed there. They stayed. These believers, these children of Israel, go into a strange place, and the place they go to is a prostitute's home, and that's where they stay. They lodge. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened, as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. That's what she's saying. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. In other words, they haven't been gone very long. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them, hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road's by the road to, to the Jordan, to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they 
lay down, the spies, she came up to them on the roof. And she said to, to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. Listen to verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. When was that? How many years ago? Four, over 40 years ago. Over 40 years ago. After 40 years of one event that has swept through the land of Canaan, the people are terrified of an event that took place 40 years earlier. The whole city is terrorized. Do you remember 40 years earlier, some other spies were sent in to spy out the land? They didn't bother to talk to the people. They just saw that they were giants, and they came back terrorized. And because of that, they are forced to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. But for 40 years, the people of Canaan, the people of, Jer of Jericho, have been waiting for a fear day. And this woman, who probably isn't 40, she's probably not 40. She's heard the story of these people all of her life. And she knows that the people that she calls family are afraid of these people. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When was that? Forty years ago. <laughs> Forty years ago. She's not telling them anything that has happened recently. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. Why? For the Lord your God, he is God. In heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord since I have shown you. There's that word. We found it. We have found that word a lot. Remember when we talked about Jonathan and uh, Mufiboseth and David and how David had made this covenant with Jonathan and Jonathan said, you need to show me kindness as I have shown you kindness and you need to promise to show kindness to all of my descendants. And so when Jonathan dies, David goes looking for a, child, uh, for a descendant of Jonathan and he finds Mufibaseth and he says to Mufibaseth, I'm going to show you kindness. And I told you what the Hebrew word is spelled H-E-S-E-D, but the H is silent and so it's really pronounced Esed, Esed. It's one of the most reoccurring words in the Bible. It's an incredible word that no English, it, it takes... It takes multiple English words to really translate it. It's translated kindness, but it means incredible compassion that leads to forgiveness and mercy. And she's asking for them, these two spies, and that's all they are. They have no titles other than spies. They don't have any power. They're not Joshua. They're not Moses. We don't even know their names. She says, I need for you to show me the kind of love that I have heard that your God shows. Esed, I need to show you mercy and grace and love and compassion to me. But not only to me, but to my father's house and, and give me a true token. And spare my father and my mother and my brothers, my sisters, and, and all that they have deliver our lives from death. That could almost be a prayer that we could hear from over here, wouldn't it? Father, I need for you to show Esed, I need for you to show compassion, mercy, grace, and forgiveness to all those that I love, all my family and friends, the ones that I care mostly about. I need for you to show them favor.
So the men answered her, Our lives for yours. If none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal Esed kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. And she said to them, Get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterwards, you may go your way. So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into this land, you bind this rope, this line, this cord, this cord that is scarlet red in the window through which you have let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own house, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head. And we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath, which you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet rope, the rope that she had let them down off of the wall in, in her window. It was, um, I was sitting at the hospital. Melvin was home, and I was at the hospital, and two of his daughters were there, Judy and Dinah, and Dinah was sitting off to the side, and Judy was sitting next to Nancy, and, and I'm sitting over on the other side of the bed, and, and I started talking. I said, it was obvious we, that we had already had the conversation. We all knew what was coming. And I made the statement to Judy and Dinah. You know, I said, I know all about you all. I know everything about you, about your grandchildren. I know stories on Melvin that I could tell for weeks. But I don't know much about your mother. Every time I went to see her, she never talked about herself. She always talked about everybody else. When it got ready for me to pray... She would always ask me to pray for others. She would very hardly ever move, but when she moved from her seat, she did so with great pain. She would either go over there with Melvin to sit by her side, or she would come over here where she wanted us to pray. But rarely, every now and then, when she was hurting real bad, she would call me and say, I need for you to pray for me. But most of the time, when she got ready to ask me to pray, it was always about a grandchild or a, uh, or a great-grandchild or, or some family member or somebody that was on a mission trip somewhere. And so when I was sharing that with um, Judy, uh, Judy said, you know, that's mom. She said, that's true. She's always been like that. She said, Mom never went on a mission trip. But she was perfectly content at praying for everyone that went on a mission trip. And of course, my church history starts flooding in. If you'll go to the two slides about William Carey real quick. The first one, uh, there, yeah, there you go. Rope up. Our undertaking to India really appeared to me on its co commencement to be somewhat like a few men who were be deliberating about the importance of penetrating into a deep mine, which had never before been explored. We had no one to guide us, and while we were thus deliberating, Carey, or William Carey, as it were, said, well, I will go down if you will hold the rope. But before he went down, he, as it seemed to me, took an oath from each of us at the mouth of of the pit to this, F, to this effect that while we lived, we should never let go of the rope. You know who's writing this? Andrew Fuller. Now, most of you probably know William Carey, but you probably don't know who Andrew Fuller is. 
Andrew Fuller was, the, was uh, William Carey's best friend. Andrew Fuller also became the, the president of the brand new, the first Baptist Mission Society. And he, he served in that role for 21 years as the president of that society. But on this day, there were three other men. Their names are recorded in history. But those three men, along with Andrew Murray, were standing there. Go to the next slide. As William Carey looked, and this was in 1793, as William Carey is about to get on that ship and head for India as the first Baptist missionary, William Carey said, I will, I'll go down into this pit, but remember you must hold the rope. And Andrew Fuller did. He spent his whole life, Andrew Fuller spent his whole life raising funds for William Carey, training other missionaries, recruiting other missionaries, and sending them. He spent his whole life holding the rope for missionaries. But he never learned. He died before he realized what was on the end of that first rope he held. William Carey went to India. He was in India for 41 years. Now, let this sink in. In 41 years in India, he lost his wife. He lost most of his children to death. But he continued to be faithful. But that's not the big thing. In 41 years, William Carey translated the Bible into 40, 40 different languages. He had to learn 40 different languages. He did that in 41 years. That's basically one new language. Handwrite it, no printing press. Handwriting the Bible. One a year. Long after William Carey's death, those scriptures penetrated into each of those different languages. Did Andrew Murray, um, Andrew Fuller, did Andrew Fuller know that when he was holding that rope, the future that was down there on the end of that rope? No, he didn't have a clue. When those four friends lowered their friend from the roof, They were just hoping for a healing in their friend's life. They had no idea that 2,000 years later, people would be talking and proclaiming about their kind of faith. We don't even know their names. We don't know a single name of any of those five individuals. But we know the story. In fact, when I began to talk about the three rope stories, before I even did, some of you were already nodding your head. I know one, I know one, and I bet it was, that one was one of the ones you thought of. What about those disciples? They didn't have a clue what God was going to do with Paul. This is brand new. He hasn't even been the two years in the wilderness yet. He's a brand new Christian. They risked their own lives to lower a brand new Christian over the... They have no idea how many Christians they spare their life of. They have no idea how many people got saved through the message of Paul. They had no idea that there'd be 13 books in the Bible written by this man they held in the basket. See, it's not just about the one holding the rope. You see, both are holding the rope in, in a sense, aren't they? There are some facts that I have discovered that, that bother me. It's always a believer holding the rope and it's always a believer on the end of the rope. And that's not the way we use this scripture at all. All three. Believer holding the rope. Believer on the end of the rope. All three stories. Incredible amount of faith. Faith where you really... 
are surprised that that kind of faith is there. I mean, Rahab? Prostitute? I think that's why God keeps introducing her that way to us. She wants to let us know that faith doesn't, isn't always where we think it ought to be. In Hebrews chapter 11, she is listed with all of the great people of faith. There she's called the harlot, but she's singled out by her faith. In James chapter 2, once again she's called the harlot and she is lifted up, but not there because of her faith. There she's singled out because of her faithfulness. By the way, those really are two things that are hard to separate. It's hard to be a person of faith and not be faithful. Don't you get sick and tired of people telling you how much faith they have, but they never show you any sense of faithfulness? Don't you think God, he's not mocked? God doesn't care when you were baptized or made a prayer. You can tell him all day about how much faith you have, but when you show no sign of faithfulness, you've already shown him that you have no faith. Not the kind of faith he's looking for anyway. There's one last place where Rahab is found. And in that place, she's not called the prostitute. It's in Matthew chapter 1, where God takes time Talk about the descendants of Rahab. And God lets us know that God had singled out Rahab to be part of one of the grandmothers in Jesus' life. That's right. Prostitute. And nobody else would have even given the time of day to. Rahab the prostitute, a woman, a Gentile. Oh, I thought this was interesting. You see, we would like this story. This story would make more sense if she was a prostitute who was having to do a, be a prostitute so she could survive. <laughs> no. This is a well-known prostitute. The king knows her, and she has her own house. She's not hurting for money. In fact, her house is so prominent that it's high in the wall with a window in the wall. Isn't it sad that we, any time we deal with sin, we always try to Make it look better or explain why they might have to be doing that in fact if you know anything in the whole land of Canaan there's only one individual not just in the city of Jericho but in the whole land of Canaan, there's only one individual that dares to believe and act on their belief. And that woman's name is recorded for us, Rahab. Now, what did she do? She, she didn't betray she didn't turn in. She hid the spies. And she lowered them down. I thought, I looked at that. I'm, I don't know. I know that there's probably more to this scripture than, than God has recorded to for me. But Troy, will you come up here for a second? Not very long. Look, if I'm going to have somebody hold the rope for me, it's going to be somebody big. This is not very long. In fact, this rope actually is 100 foot long. It was cut off. A friend of mine, Mike Clark, had bought it off of Craigslist. 
and I had lunch with him talking about a ministry thing and I told him what I was preaching I said I got a rope for you I said I don't want the whole hundred foot he said that's good because I can't even carry it can't even pick it up it's that heavy he said I'll, I'll cut off six to eight foot so he brought it to me you understand that rope back then to hold a man they didn't have the nylon and the stuff that we did very fragile you can break it it's just break it like that you can pull it you can break it to make it strong you got to take a, a zillion little pieces well I, I don't even have any idea how many of these little strands are in there but you got to round them in there a whole bunch don't count them all <laughs> to make it strong you see most of us would never lower ourselves down on a on a thread but when you look at this, you, you see strength. It's pretty strong. Do you realize no matter what end of the rope you're on, you better have a strong grip? Now, the one that's on top of the wall, if they don't have a strong grip, no loss to them. Right? Unless they care for what's on the other end. But the one that's holding on, you understand why I think if you don't agree, why I believe that in all three scriptures it's a believer on each end? Because this person is putting their trust and faith in that person. And that person in every one of those stories has trust and faith in the other person. And they're holding on strong. Now, I don't trust Troy that much to let him lower me down from the ceiling, okay? But actually, I probably trust him more than I do my own grip. You see, when I was in school, I don't think they do this anymore. When I was in school, they hung these from the gym. This rope would be hanging down like this. And in order to, to get out of that gym class with an A, you had to climb that rope and hit the beam and then come back down concrete below you there was never any mats nothing at all and you were I remember feeling like I was about 10 years old I probably was now they don't do that anymore rightly so I guarantee somebody fell how many of you had that when you were in your school am I the only Yankee in here yeah see yeah that was a pretty common thing and if you remember, you learn to use your feet and your legs and your arms and everything else. And the higher you got, you learn you don't look down. You don't look down. You keep looking up. And the first time, because you didn't always make it. I'm telling you, you didn't always make it the first time. But that one time when you got there and you hit that beam and everybody down there just exploded cheering you, you, came, you were the man. You were the man that day. The Bible says that Rahab alone lowered two men down. She doesn't tie the cord until they tell her to afterwards. How in a world? That was one strong woman. Wouldn't you agree? Okay, thank you. I don't think I would have messed with Rahab either. Let me find my Bible. Do you know someone who needs a friend, 
who needs a brother, who needs someone to listen to them, someone who to care, someone who can do they, you know, someone who needs a savior, someone who needs help, someone who is hurting and needs some healing. Are you a rope holder? Holder. Will you hold the rope for someone? A rope holder sacrifices risks, carries another individual in their hands, offers a future. They hand them the rope and they hope that they will take it. But if you find yourself on the other end of the rope, because all of us at one time will find us on the other end of the rope, you must humble yourself. You cannot get be on the other end of the rope if you have too much pride to say, I'm not going over that side in a basket. I'm not going to let a woman hung, hang me down. You can't hold me on the other end of the rope if your pride is in the way. You have to be a person of faith, which means you not only have to trust God, you have to trust the person that's holding the rope as well. Now, I know a lot of people who say, I'll trust God, but I'm not going to trust anybody else. You're going to find yourself alone because God never intended that. Not when he gave you an army. You have to trust. You have to hold on. And it would be wise if you would be still. It would really help those others holding the rope if you would just be still. scarlet rope scarlet rope scarlet is the word for sin in the Bible did you know that I read the one in Isaiah 118 though your sins be scarlet they shall be white as snow it's also the color of sin in the not only in the Old Testament it's the color of sin in the New Testament in Revelation chapter 17 verses 3 through 4 and the harlot shall come riding a scarlet horse dressed in purple and scarlet Scarlet in the Bible is the color of sin, Old and New Testament. But it's also the color for something else. They put the scarlet blood on their doors when the death angel passed over, and it meant hope, it meant deliverance, it meant a salvation. When the scarlet blood of Jesus is on the cross and over us, it washes us all of our sins. Isn't that interesting in the Bible that the same color can represent sin and salvation at the same time? Because what we definitely, desperately need is for our sin to be of a scarlet, not of our own making, but of His. It's a scarlet rope. The rope that represents salvation and hope. Where that rope would be or was, that house stands. You understand the story. You imagine Rahab. She's got her family there. First day, here comes the Israelites. She's looking out her window. Over her shoulder is all of her parents and family, and everybody is over there. They don't have the faith yet that she has, but she's told the story. They stay there. They're keeping their promise. Nobody is saying anything. They're trying to look out the same little window over the wall. Down below are the children of Israel. They're marching around. They march around. They don't say anything. They go home. She thinks, huh. They do that again six days. Then all of a sudden, the whole wall begins to tremble. And they're looking out their window and they watch all the walls fall. The whole city falls except for hers. She's the, her wall is the only one standing. And the scarlet rope is still hanging out the window. And all of a sudden they hear the screams as Israel comes through Jericho. I mean, yeah, through Jericho. And she waits with her family close to the scarlet rope. And she becomes, she becomes now 
an adopted part of the family of God. So ingrained into the her- into the prophecies and the history of Israel that you and I find her name several times as a woman of faith. She was faithful. In order to hand somebody the rope, you got to make sure that you're on the end of the right rope yourself. You can't hold on to this rope in your own strength and might. You've got to have your faith in something greater than in, than in humanity. You've got to have your faith in the one who transformed you. Who, though your sins were as scarlet, he made them white. You've got to be more than a person of faith. You need to be faithful. When you have that relationship right with him, then you won't have any problem. It'll be a lot easier for you to offer that rope and that relationship to someone else who needs it. I know I've been all over the place. Let's show them the last few picture slides. You know what that is? That's rope burn. Velvet doesn't like that picture. I don't like that picture. That person chose to hold on to the rope and not let go, even when it hurt themselves. By the way, those type of people are very few. Would you not agree? Do you have someone in your life? I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about someone. Do you have another believer in your life that would be there for you even if they suffered greatly? They would not back away. They would not let go. You got someone like that? It's a blessing, isn't it? And I hope it's not just your mother or your grandmother. Next slide. It's a lot easier to hold on the rope for someone when you're not alone. Paul had it made. It says, and the disciples lowered him down through the window in a basket. You know the problem though? Most of us have a hard time finding one. Just one. It's hard for us to find many. You may not like the sermon. I never really have cared about that much. But if you haven't figured this out, this message is more about you. What kind of brother or sister in Christ are you going to be? What kind of friend are you going to be? Will you go to your grave still praying for an individual who doesn't seem to even care? So until April 15th, when you look at this,
ask yourself a couple questions. Who is it that God has brought into my life that he requires my faith to be such that it expresses itself in faithfulness towards them by not letting them down but holding on? Second question. Holding on to a rope that's not connected to anything or anyone is not much good. And if you find yourself in need, will you dare dare humble yourself? And ask someone or some. I really need you right now. Don't let go. Every Monday morning, you some of you get some really long texts. Sometimes you get real short texts. Some Monday mornings you don't get anything. Tomorrow you probably won't. Days that are a little bit more fuller. It takes time. It takes me about two and a half hours to do that, to pray for you guys. Did you know that? It takes me about two and a half hours every Monday morning to be able to go through and pray. So I start. I used to start it with the praise team. They need it more. A lot of sin up there. <laughs> I start up there. I make it to the sound booth. And then I just start mentally going from seat to seat, remembering. But you guys keep changing, trying to remember where you are, trying to remember where you are. Try to remember the things you have shared with me. Some of you have asked me to pray for your husbands, your wives, your children. Some of you have asked me to pray for you. Some of you have never asked me to pray for you. Doesn't matter, I still do. So I go through that exercise every Monday morning. When I get done, if I still have time, I start those texts. That takes a long time, by the way, because I have to do it old school. Some of you do get copied and paste. If I do one tomorrow, I hope it says something like this. You know that I love you. And I'm doing my very best to hold on to the rope. I have faith in you. He has faith in you. Don't let go. And today, is there anyone that you need to be holding the rope for? Praying for you. Jared is finishing up too and they have the fellowship time and you know how uncomfortable he is about food he's asked me specifically and us to pray for that time his whole nature and everything about him will want him to go off in a corner somewhere but he knows that he cannot do that today I pray father that you would give him the ability and a gift that others would understand and it's not that he doesn't like their food. It's just that because of all the chemo and radiation, he can't taste anything and, and textures make him sick. So I pray, Father, that he would find extra favor with you today.
Lord, I pray that you would find us faith filled with faith and faithful. Not only to you, but to those that you give us. Help us to understand that our eyes only see what they see, but you know the future that are on the end of the rope. There are individuals here now, and those that are sick that are not here, that our people know, that desperately need us to be holding the rope for them in these times. They're not just the ones who have lost, suffered lost loved ones and those who have, are going through cancer. And there's those that are dealing with incredible strife against the enemy. Pray that you would move and that you would cause people to pray today. Make a commitment. Lay the rope down in front of you and say, Lord, God, I want to do my very best not only today, but tomorrow and not way beyond April 15. I want you to create a habit in me over the next few days by looking at this simple rope where I will hold on and I will never be too proudful to ask others to hold on for me. Father, if there's someone here that has never been under the scarlet blood of your Jesus, of your Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, may they rush to you with their whole family underneath the blood of Jesus. May they find salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.